for joining us for this event. My name is Mel Backhouse and I'm from Big Health. I've been part of a team who, with our stakeholders, have led many walking and bike riding projects over the last 12 months in response to the opportunities and impacts the coronavirus has provided us. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are all joining this webinar from today. For me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as any First Nations people joining us um, on this event today. And I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Today, we will be discussing how we can structure communications effectively to advocate for um, walking and bike riding measures such as um, new and improved footpaths, bike lanes and safer speed limits, um, or generally build support, public support for the implementation of new walking and bike riding infrastructure. You'll hear from um, one of our partners, Dr Eleanor Glenn, who is from Common Cause Australia, about the research that she's conducted. This will be also followed with a panel discussion. Um, the panel will share their experiences in applying the research and you'll have an opportunity to ask them questions. Before we get started, we've just got a little bit of um, webinar housekeeping. Um, today's session is being recorded, so I um, wanted to make everyone aware of that. Um, and wanted to thank you for joining us on Slido. Um, if you have any questions for one of our presenters or panel members, please submit them um, through this online platform. If you're on your desktop, this should appear on the page um, that you're on. And if you're on a mobile, there's a tab up the top um, of the screen with Q&A, which will take you to the submission page. You can also vote on um, questions that other people have asked that you would like to be asked by clicking on the green tick. The more um, ticks a question gets, gets um, the pro more priority we'll give it in terms of um, asking those questions. Our team will be moderating and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Um, and if you encounter any technical difficulties, please contact us via the Slido Q&A or email events at bighealth. Big Health has been working with Common Cause Australia for the past two years to research how we can frame messages that motivate action for public policy and generate public support for programs and initiatives so that we can all better champion the health and well-being of the Victorian community. With Common Cause, we've explored how to craft more persuasive messages for a number of topic areas of health promotion. Across all of our research, we've learned that not only is it simpler, but far more effective when we focus on presenting our vision for the future instead of pandering to our opposition. Even something as small as, as switching a particular word or phrase um, we use can make a big difference in how our messages are received. I can't personally tell you how helpful this research has been in helping Big Health with our communications. We are very thankful to Common Cause for this work and our ongoing relationship with them. And today we're excited to present new research on messaging for walking and bike riding measures. We'll hear um, from some of our key stakeholders about the simple changes they've made to embed this approach of messaging into their work. So before I hand over to Eleanor, I'd like to thank both our project steering committee, which consisted of Ben Rossiter from Victorian Walks, Craig Richards from Bicycle Network, Peter Cartesidimus from RACV, and Jeff Alton from MAB. They were instrumental in driving the project and interpreting our results. I'd also like to thank our COVID walking and bike riding work group, um, who met have met continuously throughout the past 12 months and have provided input and help to shape the recommendations. I hope you find this work useful um, and will be inspired today to use the insights from this research in your own communications. The more we use this approach to framing messages that are consistent um, and, use it, and use it consistently as a sector, the better we can advocate for changes and build support for changes that have already been implemented. Now I'd like to introduce Dr Eleanor Glenn, who co-directs Common Cause Australia, an organisation that helps environmental and social justice advocates engage with cultural values. Eleanor's fascination with what makes people tick led to a focus on the psychological and societal dimensions of sustainability. Eleanor is a 
a qualitative researcher and communication expert, having completed her PhD in climate change communications and engagement. At Common Core, she provides tailored support to a range of course-based organisations and each year trains hundreds of advocates in strategy and communications for social change. So, um, Eleanor, over to you. I'm muting. There we go. Does that sound okay? Great. All right. Thanks so much, Mel, for introducing and for having me here. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the messaging based, uh, values based messaging principles we use in, in all of this research that Mel. Um, I'll then go into a bit of detail as to what we did in this project on walking and bike riding. And we'll dive into the nine recommendations that came out of the research. So very briefly, um, I've, I've distilled it down to frames, values and audiences as three key ideas for you here. Uh, frames. So this image here really gets across the idea that any issue can be described in different ways and when we do that we will see things we will just see a whole bunch of associations with that that go with either in this case a duck or a rabbit so i hope that everyone can see on the one side um, the it's either the duck's bill or the rabbit's ears and on the right hand side it's the um, rabbit's nose or the back of the duck's head the interesting thing is we can see both those things but not at the same time. We toggle between either seeing the duck or the rabbit and it's the same way with the way we frame our issues and that will become a bit clearer as I go through what our framing of walking and bike riding it is, is versus our opponent's frame. So the second key thing about frames is that there are likely to be frames that are helpful to our cause and unhelpful. Um, so I've got the unhelpful one first here, choices. The reason this choices frame is unhelpful is that it focuses on the individual and um, is about individual responsibility rather than the idea of providing options, which is external to people. Um, and it's things that governments can do and it's things that we're calling for um, so that people have the option to uh, use paths and crossings and um, go on streets that have safe speed limits that make walking and bike riding safe and viable for them to do. This um, statement, cycling or walking to the station can be a dangerous ordeal, is true in some places, but the thing to know is uh, that's also unhelpful because if we're ultimately wanting people to walk and bike ride, we don't want to emphasise what's probably there latently for some people, that it is um, a dangerous activity. So it's possible for something to be true, as in this case, um, but really unhelpful to our cause. So it's always thinking about how does this make our audience feel? Um, what story is this telling about what we're actually trying to promote in the end, which is people walking and bike riding? So helpful and unhelpful frames. Another reason a frame could be helpful and unhelpful is that it engages different values. Um, and we know from social psychology that some values, when we engage them, are more likely to lead to us to support things like walking and bike riding, paths and crossings and safer streets um, because they're good for us and good for the community and other values when we um, engage them or sort of switch them on. Um, we'll do the opposite. So just waiting for this slide to load with the values. Um, so we have a values map that comes from surveying 68,000 people in 65 countries across the world. Um, sorry, it's just gone on one there. Um, and the values of caring for those in our close circle, so family and friends, there's our map, um, Beyond that, even to, so that's the benevolence, the dark green. Next to that, universalism is about beyond that to people in the broader community, um, caring about how other people, how kids and families are able to get around. And the one just to the left of that says self-direction basically is about us 
learning, growing, exploring. So we've got values like freedom and independence in that segment. So we know that those types of values in general um, for issues that are about um, measures that will improve things for everyone in our community, they're the values that are worth engaging. Um, and on the flip side, if we start engaging values like security and fear or um, wealth and power values, they dampen or suppress people's support for our issues. Thirdly, audiences. So we've seen across every issue we've looked at um, over the past eight years that there's a spectrum of people, sort of like a bell curve. So at one end we have our supporters who always agree with our propositions. On the other end we have opponents who never agree with our propositions. And in the middle we have this vast middle ground of people who are persuadable. And if we think back to the duck and the rabbit, they're able to see things from the rabbit when we put that to them clearly and, and convincingly when the opponents talk about their side of the story, the rabbit, um, they will also see it from the opponent point of view. So persuadables are really fence sitters. They toggle readily between different ways of seeing things. What we really want to do in our messaging is to move the supporters, uh, motivate them because uh, they're our choir. They will carry this message. They will chat to their friends about how amazing it is that they can go on this new um, pathway or whatever the um, thing is that's getting them enthused. We want to boost that. We also want to move the persuadables to see things from our point of view, the duck. Um, and we want to differentiate ourselves from the opponents. And sometimes doing that will we'll antagonise them. So we need to get comfortable with that. Just know that they are outliers in most issues and particularly here we can see from our survey this sort of um, breakdown of 25% su supporters, 60% persuadables, 15% opponents. So they're really outliers. Uh, so, yeah, we don't need or want to spend our airtime engaging with opponents. We... we um, really want to speak to our supporters and our persuadables. That's the key principle there. So what we did in this research really, um, or I should say the brief was to develop messages that build public support for walking and bike riding measures. Um, so measures being enablers of walking and bike riding, things like paths, crossings and safer speed limits. Uh, so what we did, just so we could have something out very quickly uh, with the COVID working group that Mel mentioned, um, we developed some quick interim messaging advice um, and then really got into the research with discourse analysis. So 20,000 words of um, publicly available sources, so media sources, websites, um, yeah, all sorts of examples there and 13 one-on-one -on -one interviews with advocates, which was really looking at what is going on in this issue in the public space, what are the main messages that we're seeing. And it became really clear that there's an advocate story, if you like the duck, and an opponent story, the rabbit. And it looks like this. So the advocate story says streets are for everyone, people love walking and bike riding, governments should make sure everyone has options to walk and bike ride. So that's, there's obviously variations on that theme, but that's the central idea. And the central opponent idea is roads are for cars. Pe people need to drive. Governments shouldn't give special treatment to pedestrians and cyclists who get in the way of cars. So when you have that frame, it makes perfect sense to say things like bikes should be banned from certain streets, which is what I saw in some of the discourse. So there are two sort of central stories that came through. What we did then um, as part of the end of that stage two was developing some really promising advocate messages that sit within that streets are for everyone's story and then taking that into a quantitative survey. So it was a survey of 1,200 people, a representative sample of the adult population, 
Um, we tested in a variety of ways in a 15-minute survey, putting messages head-to-head, so our advocate story versus opponent story, just to see where our strongest ideas were and where the strongest opponent ideas were. And we obviously want to steer away from those ones. What we also did was a dial test. So this is where people are played an audio message. They have a little dial that they dial up for things they agree with and they dial down for things they don't like and they disagree with. And what we've got is the supporter line at the top. Uh, So this is you know, it's also called a worm graft. It's a bit like in election debates when people dial up for things they like. Uh, so supporters are green at the top, persuadables are yellow in the middle, and opponents are sort of ready brown at the bottom. Often at the beginning we've got sort of all three kind of tracking up because we start with a, a nice vision that most people will agree with, but opponents very quickly cotton on to what we're talking about and dial down. You know, how outrageous it is that everyone should be able to play in the street or or bike or walk wherever they want. So um, we very quickly see that um, differentiation. And the really positive thing that we saw on um, several of these messages is that when we do tell that story loud and clear, the persuadables track with us. So you can see the yellow and the green going up together and quite high levels of support from persuadables, which is what we want. So that was our our quantitative sur- uh, survey. And then finally, we're now in stage four, sharing the um, persuasive messages with you in the, the tip sheet and the full uh, guide, messaging guide, and in this webinar and, um, uh, yeah, potentially other workshops coming up. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm going to dive straight into the nine tips. So... The idea here is that people are primarily motivated by values, emotions and identity rather than facts. It doesn't mean that facts don't matter, but values and emotions trump facts. So we really want to tap into those deep-seated, um, the you know, benevolence, universalism, self-direction values that I mentioned, things like freedom, equality and friendship, and they're the most successful messages for us. Uh, we want to avoid displacing those with economic motivations. So basically we know that um, values work in a sort of oppositional way, um, a bit like the duck and the rabbit frame. It can either be one or the other, and we want to engage those intrinsic values. So in practice, this looks a bit like uh, moving from and to these kinds of statements Uh, So the from, for every $30 the government spends on roads for cars, it spends only $1 on walking and bike riding. It's much cheaper to build footpaths and bike lanes than to upgrade or build more roads. So problematic because it's it's making us think in this economic um, frame, but also if we don't spell out why it's so important to have um, walking and bike riding, it's very easy for people to think, okay, well, if, if they're stuck in the road for frame, uh, roads of a car's frame, maybe that 30 to 1 ratio is right because we all need to drive. Um, and actually it's much cheaper not to build any more paths and bike lanes. And that's where you start seeing the discourse, you know, talk of, well, this is a bit luxury and shouldn't we be um, supporting small business during COVID or whatever other thing people think is important. So, um, really, we want to, to state our, cl- our case loud and clear. We want to move to something like no matter where we live, it's important for everyone in our community to access and enjoy our streets. That means joining up the missing links in our walking and recycling networks with more footpaths and bike lanes. We've also got another element in there, joining up missing links. It's just a very simple conceptual idea. Of course, we want you know full networks. We don't want missing links. Okay, so the next idea, this really is the core of the duck and the rabbit. So tell our story. Don't tell the opponent's story. Um, So that looks like, yeah, the goal is for everyone to have a range of of options to be able to get around. It's, in a nutshell, very simple. Um, We want to avoid telling our opponent's story. Um, We inadvertently do this in a few ways. If we are myth-busting, for example, um, car, uh, bikes are not 
clogging up car traffic. Um, we are inadvertently reinforcing that opponent's story. We put the word in not, but our brains don't really keep the not. They just keep the idea of, of bikes clogging up, getting in the way of cars, roads should be for cars. Or things, statements like, we're not anti-car. All we have this idea of is opposition and, um, uh, you know, being obstructionist at all. You know, so we, we get the vibe, we don't get the word not, we just hear anti-car. Whereas we could say, we want streets that work for everyone, would be to put it in the positive and to put it in our frame. Okay, so basically, yeah, we, we know there's a bunch of ideas that fit our frame and build support like community connection and equity, and we want to just completely avoid those that don't fit our frame and build support like congestion and convenience. And we'll just touch on that in a moment when we look at from and to. Um, okay, so the top one, so that more people can enjoy getting around safely, we should close more roads to cars. Um, instead of saying that, so that more people can enjoy getting around safely, we should open more streets to people walking and bike riding without car traffic. In the survey, that was by far and away the biggest boost in support. Um, so we split our sample, one half saw the from, the other half saw the two, and um, there was a 39 percentage point difference. So more support for opening streets rather than closing roads. Uh, and the second one, Rather than we'll ease congestion on our roads, we say things like we'll help families to stay healthy and spend quality time together. One of the reasons we don't want to talk about easing congestion is it fits right within the roads of cars frame um, where the main criterion is fast movement of cars without pesky cyclists in the way, without speed bumps, without all those types of things. Actually, when we want streets for everyone, um, we want... Uh, cars to be going more slowly um, so it doesn't fit it doesn't help us to make the case that we want fast movement of cars it does help our case when we talk about um, everyone being able to have those options in the two and um, particularly we saw when we talk about kids and families over just people that boost support um, when we talk about elderly people uh, and when we talk about different people in the community with different needs so um, people walking, people using wheelchairs and, and bike riding, for example. Okay, one just, I thought I'd throw in this, especially as Layla from Bicycle Network is going to join us on the panel in a moment. Um, so one example here, Bicycle Network is opening the street to and those different uses shown there rather than is closing the road. Okay, so tip three we know that people love walking and bike riding. They want options to help them do more. Um, so we can help tell that story to other people simply by describing, reminding people that that we all, you know, want to be able to do this. Um, what stands in our way is that external barrier of not having those options all the time and everywhere. Uh, we also want to showcase the attitudes and solutions we want rather than those we don't want. So what this looks like in practice is rather than to school, which is, again, like this, the danger one, it's, it's true but it's not helpful. It's not a helpful frame um, because it makes us think, because we're social creatures and we do kind of go with the flow, um, and what's normal and what's desired, it tells us that that's just normal and desired. But what is also normal and desired is what I've got there in the two, that many schools are encouraging kids to get to school in ways they want to, and this is the desire bit. Kids tell us they want to walk, scoot or bike ride, especially with their friends. So our job is to help make that possible for them, and that's where the options come in, provide those options for them. Okay, tip four, be positive. So people want more of, we want abundance and benefits. We don't want things taken away from us. So it's about focusing on solutions and outcomes more than the problems they address. And this is a blanket sort of messaging principle. So rather than um, one of the messaging gurus in the US describes it as, we're on the sinking Titanic, want to join us? Um, no, 
no one wants to. It's about the positives, the solutions and the, and the benefits for everybody. Um, in doing this, the order matters. So we get a boost in support when we talk about the positive outcomes before we talk about potentially challenging actions required to achieve it. So, for example, even just switching this order around makes a difference. So rather than, oh, sorry, it's just gone on. Uh, so rather than we need safer speed limits on our streets and people know that means, okay, well, I'm, I will have to change how I drive um, to make walking, bike riding good options for everyone. We get more support when it's first about what's the good outcome we all want. To make walking and bike riding good options for everyone, we need safer speed limits on our streets. So it's exactly the same words as just the order flipped. It also means rather than talking about reducing or lowering or slow speed, we talk about safer speed limits and calmer traffic. And rather than road closed, cars banned, so things taking, being taken away, um, streets restricted, constrained, school exclusion zone, no, one's wants, no one wants to be excluded. And we're not talking about exclusion, we're talking about welcoming and having um, walking and, and riding as good options. So we just reframe that, open streets, benefits, so we can all enjoy. Tip five is to humanise our communications by talking about people walking, as an example, rather than labels such as pedestrian. So if we uh, talk about things like pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, that tends to encourage people to see those as as um, identifiers and we know that most of our even our supporters most people drive might all be driven in a car if they have to pick one sort of camp um, they're more likely to, to go motorist also some sort of negative connotations we know that most people who ride a bike do not consider themselves to be cyclists so this idea was the a key sort of driver early on in the COVID working group um, process where we moved from talking about walking and cycling to walking and bike riding and that's the rationale behind the use of that term in in this um, messaging research um, we also as part of humanizing we want to invite people to tell their own stories from the heart so we can sort of talk about things in generic terms and third person but we know that um, when people give their own heartfelt example of what this feels like and how great it is so in the bottom right example then that's more um, effective so um, there's nothing wrong with that bottom statement from the left walking helps build connected communities where people know their neighbors and shopkeepers but it's quite a sort of an abstract um, you know third person statement sometimes that's appropriate it might be an opener ideally then you'll have people telling their own story of, of what that's like so this is from the bottom right example is from the um, walking strategy in victoria uh, so you can you know I, you can sort of picture that person so i imagine um it's a woman an older woman probably um i can kind of feel like uh, imagine what eaglemont um, feels like uh, i can picture ivan i can picture what that feels like to be in the heart of the village beating Okay, so this one, the space arguments were fairly prevalent when I looked at the discourse. Um, so what that means is where we're talking about who gets to use which bits of road space or how that should be reallocated, um, that's not helpful for us because essentially with physical space, one group's gain must be another group's loss. Um, so that zero-sum gain. Everyone can benefit when it's the streets for everyone idea. So we would shift away from things like too much road space has been given to cars. We can rebalance this by putting pedestrians and cyclists first. Unfortunately, you know, it is zero sum. So if someone's first, someone has to be last. This means giving pedestrians priority at traffic lights and turning our car parks into bike lanes. And similar examples where it's about you've got to lose your car park I'm going to gain a bike lane. Uh, moving to streets belong to every person who walks, bikes, who walks, rides, plays and, and drives. We're upgrading streets, so it's about more, it's about making better um, rather than less, taking away 
um, car parking, upgrading streets that currently only work for one use. We're sort of pivoting to the equity frame and, well, that's unfair if it's only for one use, um, so that everyone is welcome to enjoy them. So we've got the welcome idea as well. Again, as I said earlier, it's about how do you make your audience feel? So rather than sort of the um, unhelpful frame of, of blame and guilt and exclusion, we've got the helpful idea of, of welcoming everyone and making sure our streets do work for everyone. Seven. Okay, so we have seven of nine. Um, here, so we do need to talk about safety. Um, the way we do that is to talk about safe outcomes rather than dangerous problems. So we can highlight the benefits that safe options give everyone. Um, and, yeah, like I said in the, in the earlier unhelpful example, best not to remind people of this danger idea. We don't want to suggest they're dangerous activities. So rather than things like um, anything can happen when you're out riding a bike, branches, trains, even car doors opening or cycling and walking to the station can be a dangerous ordeal, um, we move to all kids and families should be able to enjoy getting where they need to go safely with good footpaths and bike paths, plenty of crossings and calm streets. So what, what the, those options give us, the ones listed in the second half of the sentence, is the good things in the first half of the sentence. This is a related idea that if we want to talk about, rather than speed limits, we want to talk about what safer speeds make possible. So we're focusing on the benefits of having calmer streets where people can enjoy walking and bike riding. That's what becomes possible when we have those safer speeds. So rather than, say, a focus on lower speed limits of 30 and 40 kilometres an hour have very little impact on travel times, um, we can move to we all enjoy walking to street side cafes and bike riding in pleasant neighbourhoods. That's what becomes possible when we drive at safer speeds. And in visuals, that looks like you know, this is the types of, these are the types of things we we want in our neighbourhoods and we want our kids in the right-hand side in that example to be able to, to safely ride around, uh, which is a segue to this last one. A picture really does paint a thousand words. So we process images much more quickly than we do words. Um, what we want to do in our images is to help our audiences to see themselves in those images, to be enthused and motivated by the, those great outcomes they can see, like in the last two images, and imagine using more footpaths, crossings and calm streets in their own neighbourhoods. So to do that, um, yeah, you can see on the left-hand side there that the unbridled joy on the kids' faces, uh, we can describe, say, on the right-hand side there, how um, walking helps us build connection with others in our neighbourhoods, the types of neighbourhoods we want. Um, we can also show a diversity of people walking and riding their bikes. Um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, middle-aged men in Lycra, but, um, you know, we also want to show all the other people who, who use bikes as well and all the people who walk. Um, just on that with the walking as well and kids, um, ideally we will also show kids who aren't being um, walk to school holding the hands of, of an adult. That it's also about freedom and independence, um, as in that right example there. Um, and we want to show, so on the left-hand side, we want to show that um, both walking and bike riding, they can be just for pleasure and exercise, which people respond well to, but they can also be for commuting and for going on a run to the, to the local shops. Um, so, yeah, again, that sort of diversity is what we want to get across. Uh, and then, obviously, yeah, what we want to move from is uh, ideally, well, to sum up what you do want, it's if you are showing people, uh, showing their faces, and if they look like they're enjoying themselves, then you're most of the way there. So 
the image that we move away from on the left-hand side doesn't have any people in it at all and sort of fits the opponent idea that these are white elephant, um, you know, luxuries that we shouldn't be spending money on. Um, so, yeah, always show people. The image on the right is just this anonymous, uh, you know, cyclist whizzing by, sort of not even a person. So we want to see them as people, we want to see their faces and we want to see them enjoying themselves. So that's it for the, the nine tips. It sort of all comes together here in a story structure, a vision barrier, action. Uh, we have that structure because when we start off with a vision, as we saw in that dial test, even the opponents for a while sort of come on board with this idea that everyone should be able to get around in, in the ways that work for them, the ways they want to get to, how they want to get around. Um, we don't want to leave without problem, as I said earlier. You know, once we get on board, we're thinking of the Titanic. And we want to be very specific about the action and the ask. So this is a really nice structure for doing that. Uh, so it looks something like this. There's an umbrella vision barrier action, and then you can um, tailor this to your particular ask or particular communication need. Streets are for everyone. We all want to move around in ways that are healthy and enjoyable. And then the barrier, we're painting that external barrier uh, rather than an internal choices. It's the individual not having the confidence or the skills. It's the external barrier. So many people would, who currently drive would rather walk or ride a bike, but those options are not yet available to them where they live and work. And therefore, if you know if that's the problem, not having those options, the, the action is obviously to provide those options. So governments can make sure everyone has the freedom to use and enjoy our streets by creating wider footpaths, more crossings and bike lanes that give people more options to walk and ride a bike. So, yeah, just very briefly in summary, I, I wanted to encourage you to, you know, to take heart that most people support what we are proposing. Um, so when we tell our story loud and clear, so definitely, you know, our frame about streets are for everyone and steer away from the opponent ideas, then that vast middle ground of people are with us. Um, most people support our particular asks, including bold ones like safer speed limits that we thought might be tricky to get people across the line, but it's shown in the survey when we frame it our way, they're with us. And final point, we need to repeat, repeat, repeat our story until it just seems like common sense. So whenever people hear things about walking and bike riding um, and about those enabling measures, then they think the duck rather than the rabbit, to use that analogy one last time. Uh, so that's it from me. Um, my, I'm happy for you to contact me there. I'll pass back to Mel and the panel. It's, it's just on mute, Mel. Thanks, Eleanor. <laughs> Fell for that trick. Um, yeah, thanks, for um, Eleanor, for that um, really good explanation of the different recommendations and I guess why we um, landed on those. They, they can be quite complex, but you've definitely made them um, fairly simple for us. I, I personally like to say that um, there were some that um, seemed intuitive to me or that I'd already seen examples of being used um, commonly and so it supported you know things that were already in practice and then there's some that are a bit counterintuitive or or harder to implement um, in particular at Vicals we've found it we found it difficult finding um, suitable photos to use. We don't have a lot of photos that um, that have you know people's faces and and kind of that wide variety of um, demographics and, and people enjoying walking and bike riding. So we've had to search for some of those. Um, and I think as someone that that's obviously a supporter and that rides fairly frequently, um, I found it hard not to talk about convenience um, and bike riding 
um, together while bike riding can be convenient. Um, mostly, it's most common for people to associate that convenience with cars. Um, so that was another one I found a bit tricky. Um, anyhow, now I'd like to, um, I guess, introduce you to our two panel members who have um, also been implementing the values-based messaging in their organisations and have kindly offered to provide um, some examples of how they have done this and, um, and answer some questions that you might have for them. So the first panel member is um, Ben Rossiter. He's the Executive Manager of Victoria Walks and has been leading the move towards the creation of walkable communities in Australia since Victoria Walks was established in 2009. Ben is also the Vice President of the International Federation of Pedestrians and his expertise is widely sought after in Australia and across the world. He takes great pleasure in the simple joy of walking and getting lost in urban areas and exploring new places on foot. Um, and our second panellist is Leila Asadi, uh, General Manager of Behaviour Change at Bicycle Network. She has worked for over seven years in the health promotion and active transport space, which includes overseeing national programs such as Ride to School and Ride to Work. Leila has led the charge on a recent grassroots initiatives such as Open Streets and Park It for the Planet and is passionate about working with businesses and communities to inspire healthy and sustainable habits. Um, so I'll just remind you that um, you can ask questions to the panel via our Slido, and I've already got a few questions coming through I can see in the chat here. Um, that That's in the QA section um, on the app um, or on the right-hand side of your computer if you're on a desktop. So I'll, I'll kick things off with a question um, and then we'll go to some of yours. So firstly, um, we'll ask both of you this question. Um, ben, what... Um, ben, first, what experience has your organisation had implementing values-based messaging and what has, um, I guess, been easy about that and what has been challenging about that? Thanks, Mel and Eleanor and Vic Health. It's uh, great to be involved in this. This has been a fantastic project, I think, getting everyone together, particularly walking and bike riding organisations and others together. I think for us, some of the things, first thing to say, it's a it's been a process. Um, we've used it, and I've used it particularly in meetings with decision makers like ministers, in um, media interviews, uh, in workshops, talking with the road managers like council officers and councillors, and starting to do in presentations. And I think that the key thing is it's been a process. The first time I did a media interview and tried to use value-based messaging, I did get a bit tongue-tied and I was spending a lot of time trying trying to think about what to say and what not to say. Um, and then the next interview, I start to think about, well, it is a bit of a process gradually bringing it into our work. And I look back at some of the interviews I did a few months ago and I think, oh, I could have done that better. So I'd, I'd say to everyone, you know, just really starting to look at how you can better, um, you know, uh, get support for, for some of our things. And with media, um, it, it's really trying to get across, I think, those the, the things we want first. And there's different types. There's, you know, longer radio interviews. It can go on for a while. Um, you do have to do a little bit of data, but we've started to do less emphasis on data and really go to the value-based messaging of why. So what the data might tell, but then really saying what um, we want to achieve. And with, uh, say, workshops, I think it's been really helpful. We do some workshops with, uh, say, um, councils, council officers, and when they're planning to do really good investment or they've done some really good investment, like, you know, raised thresholds uh, on, ze on zebras, round, uh, you know, pedestrian crossings on roundabouts have slowed the speed, and often they can get, uh, you know, a little bit of community backlash. So going through, you know, with them about what they've done is really good, why it is good, um, and uh, really stressing, you know, that the that you, you you what you're doing is for, you know, families, for you know, parents with prams, people with disabilities, older people, so they can have more options to get around. Really resonates with them, and I'll, I think this is important not just because we want to convince the decision makers that why it's important, but also by using value-based messaging, we can help them to get the words that they can use when they're talking to the community. So we're not convincing them, we're subtly trying to help them to get the words, even if they don't know what value-based messaging is, that they can use when they're talking to the community. And the last thing I'd say is um, it's also working with them to help them to realise, um, you know, 
when you do something good, to go on the front foot and really share and explain what you've done. Otherwise, you can leave a bit of a vacuum that the oppositional frame can jump in and start to be critical. So going on the front foot and saying why you're doing really good things that do enable people to get around um, safely, uh, you know, where they can enjoy their streets, they can uh, get to their shops, their schools, wherever it is, I think is a really important part. And hopefully that's answered that question now, but if not, we can come back to it. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I, I really um, support the idea of getting on the front foot and telling our story and making sure people hear it because too often it is the kind of vocal majority that get a lot of the airplay. Um, Layla, have you, uh, can you sort of answer the same question about the experiences you've had in using the recommendations and, and what you found either easy or challenging? Yeah, of course. Um, so I guess... I mean, there's a lot of things that we've done in our space and um, we've found the value-based messaging to be uh, instrumental in how we talk about what we do and, and, and then implement what we do. So I won't talk too much about the, um, I'll talk about a little bit later about some of the kind of things we've done wider organisationally. Um, but uh, one of the main um, examples that we've had in recent times is our Open Streets Initiative, which is a pilot run through our right to school program. Um, just to give it a bit of context, it's the first of its kind in Australia. It happens regularly and very well across and in other countries, particularly the UK. Uh, Sustrans have led a fantastic model over there, and we've, we've kind of uh, been led by that, those examples over there. But Open Streets is essentially uh, an opportunity for us to delve into the, the barriers and the challenges around um, getting kids active and uh, travelling to school. Um, we know that parent concerns and safety are one of the biggest barriers, but we also know there's a whole bunch of other things that go around that in terms of communities. Um, I think from the a framing of it, uh, when we think about what space, what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to alleviate the, the car congestion, essentially, is what we're trying to do. Um, it's, it's, it is a big um concern around um, spaces. It's, 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 it's a big issue for the schools and communities. Um, a lot of schools suffer from it. Um, and that's what we're, where we're trying to go is we're going, well, all right, then how do we reframe that from being a, a thing of suffering and a problematic thing? How do we, how do we reframe that? And so Open Streets was a, is a pilot that we have trialled and we did it with Brunswick East Primary School in Melbourne. Um, and the the plan was to work with council, with school, uh, parents, guardians and residents to look at the ways in which we could think about the school zone and the morning drop off and the afternoon pick up. And how can we make that a better space for everybody? And again, really, really look at that messaging because it was way too easy to go we, get, we have to ban cars, we have to get rid of traffic, we have to do this, we have to find a way to make kids walk or ride, we have to do, you know, trying to, which was really important. Um, and so, if, you know, you've got all those different um, departments, I guess, that you're working with. Um, council, we wanted to help support the idea of the utopia that we believe is possible and we all want to see. And as, this, as supporters of it, we think it is possible to look at alleviating issues rather than concerns that they're constantly dealing with. Um, the parents and the guardians, we want to talk about moving towards healthier and happier school trips instead of the um, we're seeing and the, and the kind of stress that parents are often under in that, that morning and afternoon period. And for the residents, we want to talk, you know, about them being part of that community too. And obviously that's a vital reorganize a morning and an afternoon drop-off session it's really important to get the residents involved and I think it's really important to kind of have a look at that and frame that in that manner that these everybody is part of this community and everybody see as being the solution and um, I think too often we look at residents that live near or inner cities especially uh, near a school street uh, and the, and the drop-off points as as if it's theirs and again kind of going your space our space is so unhelpful um, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't connect in with anybody. Um, and you know, if you live on a school street, you're also part of that community, and you need to find ways you can get it as well. So that's what we were trying to do. Um, we were trying to tackle 
all of those things and open street so what we did was we had a, a bunch of ways to look at that so we had the flyers and the emails that went to the our comms that went out to the school to the parents and the, the uh, to the residents as well and we had to kind of really look at how we were framing that so just a couple of examples i had we we talked about um we didn't want to talk about restricting cars and and ac no access for cars residents or for, for parents who may need to drive. Um, so we had to change the language in that. We wanted to talk to the residents particularly. We talked about, you know, we opened our emails with hi neighbour as a neighbour of the community rather than a resident. Um, when you get, you know, a, a letter from water for a few hours, you, you know, it's very nuts and bolts. And we wanted to change that and frame that differently as, yes, this is going to happen in this time frame. But actually, we wanted to talk about think, saying words like, this is how this benefits you rather than this is how you're affected by it. And that just reframes that conversation and it puts it in the positive light that we need to be looking at this stuff. So that's the kind of thing we were looking at. Um, we talked with families about, again, like I say, happier, healthier trips that they want to make. We talked about options all the time rather than just these are the choice, you know, you're going to be able to do this or this. We talked about options. Um, we, you know, to be as inclusive as you can, you need to think about all the different types of people in our communities and schools are obviously very good examples of that. Everybody and all short uh, shapes and sizes come to school. Options for everybody. There were students who didn't have... Um, for example, there were some kids with disabilities that, you know, couldn't walk, uh, couldn't walk or ride easily, were usually driven um, uh, in like a little motorised car, for example, that was like a cool little thing that they had. And, you know, just finding other ways for them to connect in with being part of it was we managed to traffic away from this one section, this 200 metre strip, and uh, divert the cars uh, around another way to make sure that that safe was being protected so that the children could play and have that have that space available. So that was the that was the main part of the initiative. And, and, and like I say, we really talked about healthy, happy, fun environments rather than taking away um, from the rest. Great. Thanks, Leila. Um, that's such a good example of how the messaging can be used in a kind of a programmatic sense to build public support from a number of different people within the community, um, those different audiences that you talked about. Um, and, I, and I think that sense of kind of um, reminding each of them that they're gaining something from this initiative um, rather than having things taken away from them is a really good good way to come about it. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, as a few people have been asking about accessing the slides, the slides, um, we'll, we won't be sending them out, but we'll. Um, everyone has the guide, the tip guide, both the short version and the long version, um, which essentially are the same as the slides, and we'll have this recording that will be sent out um, at the conclusion of the webinar as well. Um, the next um, question we have is uh, about... Sorry, just got to find it up the top here. It's about inclusion and um, how do you make sure that when you're using the messaging um, guide that you're being inclusive of people um, in wheelchairs or with other mobility devices um, and does walking include everyone? And I might just throw to Eleanor for this because we did do some specific testing on this that she can let you know about. Thanks, Mel. Yeah, we were very conscious of this because right from the beginning, when I thought walk, I thought someone on two legs, you know, literally walking along. Um, but obviously we wanted to include people in wheelchairs as well. Um, and Ben, who obviously has a lot more experience in this field than me, said, well, I think that people um, who use wheelchairs and interpret walk in that way. But we decided, okay, let's just test it in the survey. So what we did is to ask um, specific questions on how people get around and of those people who said yes I get around um, using a wheelchair we then looked at their answers to another question which was about how often do you walk and another question how often do you ride a bike and the people who use wheelchairs chose um, I walk uh, every day which was the top answer um, and ride a bike every day, the top answer, just as much as people who don't use a wheelchair or even more so. So they, they're interpreting this, this term walk um, to mean using their wheelchair and also, interestingly, you know, ride a bike. So those people were also saying, yep, I do this every day. 
um, which I was surprised at. Um, so I think it's fine to say walking and bike riding and those people know that that includes them. Uh, but in um, in interviews, uh, so we also you know, spoke to some people who use wheelchairs, they appreciate being explicitly included in phrases like people who walk, use a wheelchair and ride a bike. And we did that in our longer messages um, right up front, which sort of sets the scene, includes them, and then as shorthand later on we just shifted to, um, so later on in a, you know, say a paragraph shifted to just walking and bike riding. So I'd encourage you to do the same, to, to make it explicit sort of somewhere early up if you have a long, long document and, and then you can use the terms walk and bike ride to include them. Thanks very much, Eleanor. I think that's a really good um, point to just, um, yeah, emphasise. And, um, yeah, we're glad we were able to test that in the research. Um, the next question I have is, would this approach be suitable for messaging to policymakers as well as the general population? And um, We often hear we should um, be using facts for, for policymakers rather than, than values. Um, I don't know whether you want to answer that, Eleanor, or someone else wants to jump in, maybe Ben, who does speak to policymakers. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in first. Um, uh, yeah, I think, well, first thing is policymakers are people and uh, the people have values. So I think it's very important to um, message to policymakers and when we're speaking with them to do value-based messaging. And the other thing is, yes, they're interested in data and research, but, you know, Victoria Walks, we pride ourselves on being an evidence-based organisation. We use a lot of evidence, a lot of data. But as I look back over the last dozen years or so, um, just doing evidence and data, I feel that we haven't got the results in policy we would like. So I think just doing evidence and data or concentrating for policy makers uh, might not be as effective as combining it with value-based messaging. So I feel it's very important to get the, the, the right messages across and combine them with research. We've certainly changed our approach a little bit where we're, I'm not saying we emphasise data and research less, but we pick out um, really key things that will then coincide with good value-based messaging. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. Um, this one might be one for you, um, Eleanor. Uh, how can we keep supporters from becoming too vocal and perceived as a nuisance to persuaders? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure it's sort of if someone had an exact, um, a specific example there, but Perhaps it's about tone, um, the way that supporters are getting across that message and um, if we can always keep in mind that our task is to reach persuadables and move them to support us, then that's probably helpful. Um, so a, a colleague of mine has a saying that we need to roll out the welcome mat. Um, so I, I think if you have that in mind, then it won't be perceived as being sort of a nuisance. And perhaps it's also in the framing about always showing how measures are going to benefit everyone. Um, so, again, it's, you know, how could it be a nuisance if it is, this is for everyone, for kids, for families, parents walk, walking with prams, elderly people. Um, it's for everyone in our community to have these options available to them. Can I add to that, Mel? Um, while you were talking, Ellen, I just thought, you know, the supporters, some people, I think, you know, in the Twitter sphere or social media, um, we do get some, I guess, some keyboard warriors, for want of a better word, particularly those who are supporters. And sometimes they can use language which plays directly into the opposition framework, like we must ban cars, cars are the enemy. It's not this, it's cars are the enemy. So that's something where I think we have to be careful. And I think for us as an organisation, we, we won't enter into those conversations because they will go into the opposition frame. So even people who might be uh, harder supporters will often use a language that might not help the um, the cause. So it's been a bit careful of who we engage with in those situations. Thanks, um, Ben. That really, yeah, that really helps, I think. And I've, I've got another one that probably is for you as well. Um, from my experience, traders care more about values. How can we get traders on board using values? So similar to the policy makers, but, but more about the traders. 
That's a really good question. I've got to try and think of an answer because there's a few things going around my head. And I think, yes, in the way they do like facts, but sometimes when facts are given, they don't hear them because often people have their own preconceived ideas. So, again, I think it's a bit of a, 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 um, a combination. Uh, just, you know, the, it's on our website, one of our research reports looked at um, of how people get to shops and looked at the data and a lot of strip shops, people are really walking, but sometimes traders aren't hearing that. Uh, and they're often coloured by their own experience, which is a lot of traders actually drive to shops themselves because they live out of an area or their staff do, so they assume everyone does. So I think um, it's a bit of a mix and we have to look at the values and also look at the values which might be important to them about having vibrant, uh, communities, strips where people want to stay, they want to hang out, they want to connect with others, they want to get there easily so they stop and they will, you know, uh, spend money and that sort of thing. So I think it's a, it's a bit of both but with traders trying to think about what values are important to them and when we're doing media around those things, often we get traders on site uh, who are on site who do support uh, wanting more walking and bike riding and public transport to come out and speak and say why they like it. So that's kind of using traders to talk to other traders. Yeah, that, thank you, Ben. I think um, Eleanor had a few points on that as well, so we'll jump to her. Thanks, Mel and Ben. Yeah, I just wanted to share with everyone in the full message guide rather than just the tip sheet, summary sheet, at the end we have a section on dealing with opposition frames. Um, so these were the most common ones that the, um, the steering group and the working group had been grappling with. And just to give you a flavour of that one that we just discussed and the others, they are, one, don't take away my car parking spot, have a deal with that. Two, without car parking, customers won't come to my shop, the trader one. Um, three, people caught texting while crossing the road should be fined $200. They're so going to the personal responsibility blaming sort of frame. Um, and four, just like drivers, cyclists should pay rego for the roads they use. So um, tease up, there you go. You've got um, <laughs> some uh, tips for, for all of those. But if we can just jump straight back to the trading one and the question that uh, was about traders being convinced by facts. Um, unfortunately, the proof that traders aren't usually convinced by facts is that we have the stats that show, you know, when we're talking small businesses, high street shops, people who walk and bike ride stay longer and spend more. Um, but that fact by itself, you know, it doesn't cut through. And unfortunately, that's what we often see with facts. What we can do is point out so as Ben said people sort of have their preconceived ideas and maybe they drive themselves and maybe because it's obvious when we see people parking and the car takes up that space there in front of the shop that we assume that everyone um, drives we, we know from other surveys that um, people grossly overestimate the number of people who drive and park there it's just because it's so visible there on the street um, so we might not notice and traders might not sort of notice that um, what we can do is to say that, it, to, to tell that alternative story. So many people walk or ride a bike to their local shops and many more do where it's safe and easy. And that's really what we want to encourage. We're saying um, we want to create that enjoyable experience. That's what people want. That's what they why they come to certain places to linger, to enjoy it, um, to spend money there. Um, we can also tell so showcase particular examples. So just tell an anecdote about a specific example. When we upgraded X Street um, with a new bike lane and crossing straight to the shops, people took up the offer. They walked and rode their bikes um, like to the shops like never before. And even better if you've got, you know, somebody who um, is willing to tell their story, like the, that little um, snippet about the Eagle Mont shops and Ivan. Um, so if someone can say, you know, how much they enjoy walking or riding to the shops, um, they're the things that the media will pick up. They're the things that sort of resonate with people. They create an image in people's mind that that's actually a thing people do rather than just seeing the cars parked on the street. Thanks, Eleanor. That's, um, yeah, that's really useful as they, it is quite tricky to balance that, um, creating the vision and the emotion um, with getting some of the facts across that are 
convincing. Um, I think we did see it as well with the outdoor dining um, situation and that um, I guess that created an opportunity to use some of those car spaces for other purposes other than parking and um, we, sh we could showcase how um, one, traders were supportive of that because it helped their businesses and, and two, we had sort of, um, you know, people enjoying the streets in different ways than we'd seen before. Um, the next question that I've got is, I might throw it to Leila. Um, as I said, mentioned, this is a tricky one that um, Vic Health found tricky ourselves. Um, is there a good place to find diverse images of people in Australian environments that are cycling, walking and scooting? Yeah, um, it is a tricky one. Um, and we found that the answer is no, there isn't really a place. <laughs> um, I think what you have to do is you have to you have to do it yourself. You have to be willing to put that, to go out and find those images. I think uh, we find a lot um, with our events and uh, a lot of the things we do. When we're trying to put promos together to showcase anything we're doing, whether it be an event like, you know, uh, around the bay or anything, through to, uh, you know, encouraging people to write a work, it is important to showcase the the Australian population and and you have to, you have to just make sure that you are... Um, you're committed to doing that. And I think a commitment to doing that means you have to, you know, and it seems really, uh, it can seem, it can seem a really tricky thing to do, um, especially if you're going to have to put metrics around it. But you often do. You have to put metrics around it. Have you got a, a good gender split? Do you have people of uh, non-white backgrounds, ethnic um backgrounds in your photos do you have a, a bunch of children do you have elderly do you have a mix of people who you want to see in this world doing these activities are you representing that so I think you have to take responsibility for doing it and create it yourselves and go find and go look for it it's not it's not suitable anymore for us to hire our videographers or whoever we hire to do that stuff sometimes it's in-house sometimes it's external um, and say just shoot what you can and oh we didn't get many women that day or oh, well no, it's not good enough. You have to, there are women out there on bicycles. You have to go and find them. So I think it's a case of making sure you commit to it. Um, unfortunately, I don't think, I mean, maybe there are, maybe other people do have answers that there are, there is a bank of something out there, but we've just created our own. We've just started creating our own. Uh, as a not-for-profit, often we don't have the cash to go out and get models and, and all the rest and my face is plastered around a fair bit so as everyone else is here <laughs> you'll have seen various people from bicycle network over the years on different things but it, sometimes that's what it comes down to uh, to make sure that you are going to hit those quotas if you like and to make sure that you are being as representative um to showcase that you are welcoming and expecting that this is a space and a place for everybody that you're what you're doing and you're working towards is that um I think another thing just on imagery, if I could just uh, mention, is um, I spend a fair bit of my time being really kind of cautious about what I wear, how I dress. I'm a, a rider for transport, really, in the main, and um, I try not to let my what I need to wear to get in the way. Um, when I'm going to meetings or um, back in the day when that was a thing, when I go to places, I like to turn up um, – ironically not necessarily looking like I'd been on a bike so I wanted to wear clothing that just represented a normal person we have to start normalizing this part of this value-based messaging is also linked with normalizing and the social norms I think one of the tips in there was yeah tip three desire and social norms and we have to really work towards that and I think one of the ways we try to do that is by making sure we are not just representing as many people as we can and the diversity but we're making sure we're making this a normal activity and so when I turn up at a meeting I often I take my helmet in to, to be the symbol that I have ridden there, but I'm often in skirt, heels, lipstick, whatever that is, to make sure that I'm not going, this is what you need to be able to do this activity, to ride a bike, you need to da-da-da. And people are often go, oh, you rode here. And they literally look me up and down and go, all oh, right. And I think that's the kind of thing we have to start doing more of. We have to start taking accountability and personal responsibility as individuals and as groups and as organisations to do that and wherever we can be visible um, in that space and and to show that we want to see that change and be that change. Um, and I think it's really important that that social norm of making this just what, you know, again, we go back to choices, we're offering choices to people. We all do a version of things. We are all in cars. We're all on bikes. We all walk. We all, you know, we, we, we do a variety of things and we just need the choice depending on the task in hand to get to somewhere. So, yeah. 
Great. Thanks, Layla. Um, and, of course, we can all um, share images with each other too while we're building up that, that collection. Mm -hmm. We borrowed some from um, Transport New South, for New South Wales. Um, and I know as Department of Transport are rolling out their pop-up bike lanes that they're getting more and more images of um, people, happy people, families, young kids, women um, using those pop-up bike lanes. Um, I, yeah, just add to that, Mel. I think because we've got a, a lot of uh, the audience from councils and things like that, when you're doing your budgets, include a photo shoot. I think it's really, we don't do that. We often come back to it afterwards, later, how can we get money to do it? And I think we have the same issue Bicycle Network does and, and later I've <laughs> it's often turned up when I've ridden my bike to meetings and I've got my panty and people say, you've ridden a bike, but you're a walker. It's like, you know, it's just normalising the way we get around. I think it's really important. But uh, the photo I've got behind me, you can see, is wonderful down in Warrnambool. And, you know, it doesn't have a lot of people, but every photo, if it's showing urban design, should have people in it. This one I like because it's got 30K in the background and there's a, a woman who's walking who's got a... Um, a, a uh, uh, seeing, I'm trying to think what the word is, uh, seeing I came and she's just going straight across the, because there's a wonderful pedestrian crossing. So story, I think photos that tell a story are really critical. You can use photos of people in public. You don't need to take, you can take photos of people walking around and use them because it, it's better to have a natural looking photo than a staged European and North American photo. So natural is really important value-based messaging. If you want you know, uh, the, the happy smiling faces, often you'll have to do a photo shoot and get permission. But key thing, build it into your budget, I think is important. Thanks, Ben. Um, Eleanor, you've got a comment on photos as well. Just a, a two-second thing to add. People can spot uh, stock images a mile away, and I don't know about you, but I'm allergic to them. Um, so whether it's your own photo shoot or just a candid shot in the street, it's it's so much better than a stock photo. So it, the the real real, if you like photos in the street or with with people you're interviewing, um, really convey that idea of real people. Um, people's passion, like the, you know, the kids um, with their unbridled joy, that picture, um, it means so much more to your audience than a stock photo. So, again, I just um, <laughs> add to everything that Layla and Ben um, have just said. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, I've got another one for you. It's um, is the supporters, the 25%, where persuadables are 60% and opponents are 15%, based on a particular survey or is it just being used to demonstrate the point? Yeah, good question. So those percentages are the ones we found in our survey of the 1,200, uh, the representative 1,200 people we surveyed. Um, there are often similar percentages across a range of social and environmental issues. Um, so the key point being that opponents often are the outliers even though they can be quite vocal about it it's just um, remembering that they're outliers and um, not engaging and basically um, being comfortable that we have a supporter base and we also have that fast middle ground of people who are persuadables. Great thanks Eleanor. Um, I've got a pretty general question here, and it's um, if others are walking um, from the walking and bike riding sector were attempt to do the same about using these recommendations, what advice would you give them? Um, I might go through each of you, maybe starting with Layla first. Yeah, um, I think my advice is to keep it person-centric, you know, person-centred. We are not talking about objects and things. We are, again, the value based is around people. Um, so we try to talk about people on bikes as often as possible rather than cyclists, as we've discussed. Um, we say things like our language around um, a, cra you know, a crash, not an accident, um, really helps uh, frame things again in the, in the correct manner. Um, and it help, it just helps normalise what's actually going on in real life and in that space. And so I think there's a lot of stuff around that. So um, those kind of specifics. Uh, but, yeah, I'm always making sure we're finding ways to talk about what, what we want from a person perspective and what we're trying to do for um, 
what we're trying to create, what is our utopia, what's our, our, our goal and our mission and our aim in terms of trying to um, bring people together to create these healthy places. Um, I often find that, you know, one thing that we I've noticed over the years, you know, as a health, you know, we're, we're kind of branded under as a health promotion organisation. And what we, you know, one thing you have to kind of be careful with in that is, not to steer too much into the personal health. You know, we often talk about people's personal health. And of course, there's a lot of intrinsic motivation and um, behavior that goes on around intrinsic motivation and um, therefore people's own personal has massive um, implications in how they might travel, choose to travel around uh, or, or use, use um, active transport. But I think uh, we have to keep almost making sure that we are making sure that is broader and we are thinking about the health of our communities and the health of our societies, because as much as our individual healths are important and we're trying to, you know, lower uh, um, the health, the national health bills by some of this work as well, we are really talking about a, a better society and a better, healthier planet and, uh, and a better environment for all of us to have that. So I think just making sure that we are thinking about people before we're thinking about objects and items and we're thinking about wider concept of um, society uh, as, as you're doing it um, to make sure that again we're we're not going to let ourselves down into one row that's almost becomes a dead end because we can't kind of back ourselves out of that corner when you're talking a bit more holistically as well that can often help um, that'd be a couple of things from me. Great thanks Leila. Um, ben uh, any um, tips that you haven't already mentioned yet for people that yeah. might Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've sort of mentioned before, but reiterating, just use, be really clear about the data you want to use. Don't overdo it and, and back, back it up with and open up with the messaging, but really do really upbeat messaging. So when you're talking, stress the really good stuff, the stuff, you know, and I think describing People like, uh, you know, things like, you know, if it's, el you're talking about elderly people, you know, you mentioned that many might have a vision impairment, a disability, so people can connect and they can see. I think, um, you know, who you're trying to really get the message across and they can see the joy of kids walking or bike riding. I think those things which connect to people in their own, might be their own um, uh, interests or what they did as adults, what they might have done as children. So I think it's just trying to find those things which connect. Um, the other thing is don't get sucked in. It's a bit like what I was kind of saying before, but don't get sucked into preaching to the converted. We could do some social media which might get a really good um, you know, number of likes and comments and whatever, but it's only the converted who are liking and commenting, I think we've failed. So it's really about how we can get the, really think about the persuadables and how we can get them over. Don't preach the converted. And the other thing is, um, obviously in interviewing, we do quite a bit of media, but interviewing techniques that uh, even with the interviewers, the, I find if you, the ones we call more shock jocks, don't repeat their words, don't use the opposition frame, don't use the congestion, go to the words you want to use and put it in a value-based messaging. And when you do, when you're talking about kids and families and elderly, it makes it harder for them to then come in uh, and do the opposition frame. Uh, it's because often their listeners will be, if you like, elderly, so it's really appealing to them. Um, that's just a tip I found. Hopefully it works. Yeah, really good tips, Ben. I think they're very important ones to keep in mind. Um, Eleanor, do you have any um, final tips or um, advice for people that hasn't already been mentioned? Yeah, I think uh, Layla and Ben's tips were spot on. I, I hurriedly scrolled three things that I think sort of um, sum up what I'd recommend. So one is thinking about... Why does this really matter? That's what it is at the heart and that's where the values come in. So what, what do we really want in our lives? You know, we want to be healthy. Um, you can build in here all the things that walking and bike riding will always have over driving. So driving disconnects us. Instead, in our lives, we want connection. So we want to be able to walk down the street, say hi to the neighbours or at least feel like that's the kind of neighbourhood we live in. Um, what do we want for our communities? Um, I haven't mentioned this to date, but um, in the survey, climate and environment and, you know, transitioning to a different way of getting around um, resonated with persuadables. And I was a bit surprised. I wasn't sure that that would. Um, so it's these deeper things that matter in our lives. So first, that's the first point. Um, 
The second one is kind of related, is to ask yourself, how does my message make people feel? And so it is, as I said earlier, about welcoming and inclusion um, and that these these improvements we're talking about um, in our streets are um, be- going to benefit everybody. Um, and thirdly is a really practical one, just building on what Ben was saying earlier, it's about finding the words that work for you. So I strongly encourage you to look at the longer guide, not just a tip sheet, um, and, and pull out those ideas, those um, specifics that work for your, your issue, your um, local situation, um, whatever the asks are, if it's, you know, sort of about shops and traders or it's about um, kids that are walking and bike riding to school, you'll see examples in that longer guide. Um, and then it's about practising and repeating so that, you know, over time this will just roll off your tongue. Um, it will become much more natural and much easier for you. So, yeah, that, that would be the three things I'd encourage you to do. Excellent. Thanks, Eleanor. And there's one more here for you, I think. Um, does values-based messaging primarily appeal to that 60% persuadable audience as the target audience for change? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, it's a yes and kind of um, answer to that. So, yes, we definitely want to move the persuadables to see things from our point of view. We also want to always make sure that the message is also what work for our supporters because our supporters are the choir they are the ones who who will um step up and you know be the sort of ambassador champion sort of role um for us if we ask them to um they will be the ones who will um step up and respond on talkback radio or they'll be the ones who will on social media say yep this is so fantastic. I love writing down X Street or whatever it is. They'll also be the ones to talk to their friends and family or their work colleagues or the ones who will um, rather than sort of, you know, maybe even hide that they walk a bike, they'll be the ones like Layla to bring the helmet into the meeting and for everyone to go, oh, wow. Um, so it has to work for our supporters as well as our persuadables. Um, but the good news is when we... When we do tell our, our stories loud and clear, we do tend to see that tracking like we saw in the dial message that it works for supporters and persuadables. Excellent. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I've just got probably one last question to finish on, and it's um, is there a simple change anyone can do in their community to promote people walking and bike riding? And I might, again, ask um, each of the panellists to have a short answer to that because um, we'll wrap up after after this one. Who wants to go first? I'll ben? have a crack. I'll have a crack. <laughs> I think just on a personal level, um, one of the things we always is a challenge is, you know, people don't ne- We all walk uh, in wheelchairs, whatever we're walking, and but people don't identify as walkers so i just say celebrate walking you know out yourself as a walker you love walking when you're out in your neighborhood smile say good day you know enjoy it connect with your neighbors there's no better way of connecting with your community than just walking it so i think just think about how you relate to people in your community and one example of something i did uh, at the start of our first lockdown i put a book library in our front yard and I spent a lot of time sitting in our front yard and the book library people come swap books I've had so many conversations I've got to know people in the community just by having the book library in the front yard there's things we can all do in our neighborhood just to connect but the the best thing is just yeah celebrate it love it you know get out and walk um it's wonderful thanks Ben uh through to you later yeah, I think um, I think the things, I mean, internally, one of the things that we are going to keep working on is is change, is the shift in languages. Uh, what Eleanor was saying about, you know, just choose, choosing the words that work for you um, and, and, and trying to practice them, repeat them. I think one thing that I found is that 
when we were doing the Open Streets Initiative, I'd still have meetings internally where people were going, all right, so that road closure, and I go, no, no, that open street, and it's just making sure, and they go, yeah, yeah, we know that, and it's like, well, we've got to shift that, haven't we, because if we say it too often internally, we'll never get used to saying it externally, and never become part of our usual normal vocab, so I think the more often you can have opportunity to practice, which starts from any moment you're thinking about it in your head, through to when you're having your meetings with your team, through to externally talking about it, that's absolutely key. So I would say making sure you're practicing it as often as you can and choose finding those words like we've all talked about that kind of make sense and that feel comfortable. And with that, you know, giving giving yourself enough time to get this right. It's not easy and it's not straightforward, but it does make a lot of sense. You're like, of course, we need to talk about streets are for everybody. And, and so when you once you switched into that mode properly, Getting it right is still important. And I know that when we were sending the flyers and creating the comms and the copy for stuff, I know that the Open Streets team that were working on it on the front line were getting pretty annoyed at me because I was like, I'm sorry, guys, we just just hold off on this because I, I just want to make sure we've got this right. And I need to be well and I just want to make sure. And, you know, just checking in and knowing that you've got it right um, is better than, you know, pushing something out that might not be you feel fully comfortable with. Um, and I think just my other thought is, you know, when you're thinking about who you're working with and, society is not binary and we need to st keep constantly reminding ourselves of that we all need options and we're all like I was saying you know we're, we're people that need different things some days I might need a, a, you know I need to walk somewhere easy or can walk somewhere easily somewhere sometimes I'll need access via a pram sometimes I'll need access via with a bike and, and, and I need to know that those are available and so when we're thinking about whoever we're talking with about again what's that utopia what do we really want out of life and what do we think possible reframing it within with not within binary kind of terms is is often very useful as well so yeah, they're my thoughts great thanks Leila and over to you Eleanor I think I don't have a lot to add with the great responses from Ben and Leila um, I suppose the only other thing is just to say that Messaging is one part of a bigger strategy. So the words are not the silver bullet. What works is a broader strategy for um, engaging people in this. Um, so, for example, if you know that, um, say, opening a street might potentially be a, a bit contentious, then how do you put in place right from the get-go, you know, engaging people, talking to people who live there, um, having maybe ambassadors or, or um, other people in the community who love the idea, who are going to spread the word. Um, so all the other elements of, of strategy and engagement come into play, uh, not just the words. Great. Thanks, Eleanor. And I wanted to say a big thank you to all three of you, Eleanor, Ben and Layla. I think everyone will benefit from your experience and insights that you've shared with us today. Um, and, yeah, thank you to everyone and the audience for tuning in. Vic Health will be using the recommendations to improve our own communication and use consistent values-based me messaging language in our work. Um, we hope that you can all benefit from these tips to improve your own messaging going forward. Um, if you haven't already read the walking and bike riding message guides, um, I've got the... Oh, is that the right slide? No, that's the right one. Um, yeah, then you can access the, the full guide and the summary sheet um, on the link there, uh, which will be available in the email that we're sending out following this workshop as well. And for general updates on values-based messaging work, sign up to um, the subscriber list and then we'll share our broader values-based messaging insights. Um, we will be sharing, as I said, the recording available with um everyone on email after this and you can share it with anyone else who might be interested and thanks again for joining us we hope that it's been really useful for you have a great day everyone